Amen. Thanks again to our worship team for leading us this morning. And great words, as we have just sung, that God is faithful to every generation. And I think about the theme for today and that we would be that generation too, whether the generation that's just rising up, okay, don't leave me hanging, all right, or the next generation. And uh, the, all the generations that are represented here, we just trust, you know, God's faithful in us, right, to every generation, and that we, we would be numbered as those in our time and in our era that walked with God and that left a legacy of faith and faithfulness. And so it's within that context that we're going through the Bible, and we're in, as uh, Robin, you pointed out very clearly, these are some tough, tough things to gr- come to grips with as we think about the history of Israel and the ups and downs and the faithfulness and the faithlessness. And, and so we're going through the Bible, and I, I think it's important that we're doing this because we get the entirety of themes of Scripture as we're going through it in this year, and not just Pastor John's favorite passages or any of our favorite you know, words and, and phrases and, and psalms and, and all that. We can do that, and that's okay, but when we see the entirety, I think it helps us focus on how great our God is in the midst of our struggles and failures. So just a reminder, the story is the guidebook that we're using to go through the Bible, and it is Scripture that we're going through that's pieced together in a unique way. And, you know, always keep your, your Bible as well alongside it as we go through these studies and our small groups, our community groups, right here at church. Bring your Bibles, make it a New Year thing to bring your Bible to church even. And, and as we look at selected passages, um, you can follow through in that way as well. So the story, the whole family, the whole Bible, the whole year, and we're um, in the book of First Kings, and again, this hard look at a kingdom that uh, God had crafted and put together, and in spite of the people and their imperfections, it created this amazing dynasty of God's people in Israel and the kings like David and Solomon, but that didn't last, and we're going to take a look at why that happened and what God did even in the midst of it. And so we'll take a look at just a few verses from this passage, these, these chapters for today. But I want to get a start with uh, kind of setting the tone and the theme with this old, old story of a real thing that happened. Uh, anybody heard any uh, versions of the Hatfield and McCoy battle back in, let's see, Kentucky, I think West Virginia, kind of these kind of not deep south, but southern kind of states that uh, these families lived near one another and they feud, had these hor- this horrible fight between 1863 and 1901. So it's a period of about 38 years. I was kind of intrigued and I dug in a little bit, watched some videos on History Channel and other things about it. And it's just like, wow, you wouldn't believe how these people were living and just the tough lives people lived when they added this dimension of people going after each other and literally wanting one another killed. But uh, the first thing in recorded incident of their fight, their feud, family feud, came in 1863 when Asa McCoy was returning from the uh, Civil War and he was murdered. So he was coming back home from the Civil War. He was murdered. One of the Hatfields was blamed for it. Although it was later discovered, the one they blamed for it was homesick. But never mind that. It had started wrong connections and all that. And then about 13 years later, so the, the fighting just started there. And then it just, amp, it just escalated in different degrees. And then 13 years later, big incident was over a dispute over the ownership of a hog. Markings on its ear. It's mine, it's yours. And lots of, I won't go into all the gory details of everything in between as well, but just reminds us of the sadness and the power of division and anger and hostility between people and what can start in a spark can start in a total wrong way right misunderstanding wrong thing something didn't actually happen but it just escalates into who knows what and I think if we're honest, we probably could take a look and think, yeah, I've seen that happen. I've seen misunderstandings and disagreements happen, maybe even in my own family, maybe in my workplace, maybe among a friend. And it's ugly, isn't it? It's hard when these things grow, and it's stuff that keeps you up at night, 
and you wake up with first thing in the morning. You ever had one of those just gut-wrenching trials that you've gone through over a broken relationship? So as we start for today, I'm sorry to be the heavy bringer of all this bad news, but I believe me, it's going to help us direct us, I think, on a right path as we get into, as we, as we go further now into this already, you know, trains left the track, it's, it's 2020, or 2020, and we're, we're moving fast, aren't we? But um, just let's look to the little bit of the background um, and the story of Israel's division. And in the passage before this, um, for yesterday, actually I'm kind of overlapping chapter 11 of First Kings ended last week, and I'm starting with chapter 11 today because I want to remind us that um, if we look to First Kings 11, uh, King Solomon was this great king, right? Solomon, wise Solomon, the one who had asked God for wisdom above anything else he could ask for, and, and he was given that, and he had that wisdom, and and reap the benefits of it in, in all kinds of different ways, spiritually, politically, economically. But little by little, he stopped adding that wisdom and looking to God for wisdom and looked to his own ways for how to lead this kingdom that God had given him. And it's kind of like that old analogy of a frog that's dropped into a... Uh, a kettle. And if the frog is dropped into a kettle right away of boiling water, like anything, anyone, it, it's going to jump out as fast as it can once it touches that hot boiling water, obviously. But if that frog is placed in lukewarm water on a stove top, let's just say, or whatever the setting would be, and the heat's just gradually turned up without even knowing it, the frog gets cooked. Lights out, right? And it's, there's so many interesting analogies to how that can happen to us. Maybe not in a literal kettle on the stove kind of way, but, but uh, uh, we just get melded in to whatever's going around us and we don't even realize what we're doing or the ways that we're adopting from the ways of the world and we're, we're, we're changed in a bad way. So Solomon was like that. He... Uh, he, one of the, his great downfalls was the way he created uh, allegiant alliances between countries. So Solomon, God gave him all this kingdom to, to rule wisely, and he expanded it through his human, oh, if I make an alliance with this king, and I take on wives from this country, just the way they did it, and then we're all friends, and we all work it out. So he, adopt, he took on 700 wives, Solomon. Does that sound smart to anyone out here? <laughs> I don't know, if you're Solomon, I guess I can't say I've ever, will be or be in his foot's, in his shoes. But, um, so, and not only did he take on these 700 wives, but these wives worshipped other gods from these other countries and talked Solomon into building temples so they could worship their gods. So it's just going from bad to worse. And again, God's word doesn't change. What is the first commandment? I'm the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. So God visited Solomon one day and gave him this message. And I'll read for you. And as I read this, remember this. Getting your focus off God is the root cause of division. So all's going look gloriously for Solomon, but his eyes go away from God, and things start to unravel and literally crumble. So from 1 Kings 11, 9 through 13... The Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. Although he had forbidden Solomon to follow other gods, Solomon did not keep the Lord's command. So the Lord said to Solomon, Since this is your attitude and you have not kept my covenant and my decrees, which I commanded you, I will most certainly tear the kingdom away from you and give it to one of your subordinates. Nevertheless, for the sake of David, your father, I will not do it during your lifetime. I will tear it out of the hand of your son. Yet I will not tear the whole kingdom from him, but will give him one tribe for the sake of David, my servant, and for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen. So hard news, bad news for Solomon. And again, getting your focus off God is the root cause 
of this division, and we see Solomon's divided heart. Solomon's divided heart is clearly seen here. And Scripture continues to relate to Scripture, Old Testament, New Testament. Uh, Jesus himself said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. And that's true. That's true in so many tangible ways. And I think about preserving unity. I think about as the pastor, as your pastor of this church, the greatest thing I can do to preserve the unity of this church is to start by walking humbly with the Lord by receiving from God's Word and, and, and having that personal walk with the Lord. Same thing as a, as a husband, right? To continue to walk with the Lord and trust in Him first that that would bring unity in my marriage, with my family, as a dad. Um, same is true for all of us, right? That's where we, can, that's where we need to start every day. Every, every overarching theme of our lives, God, what is your will? What is your desire? Let me look to you first before I think and plan and, and go all different directions. That will keep away from this divisiveness that's in any house, whether it's a church or a home or a friendship, a relationship. So as we think about this, yes, there are many external and internal forces that threaten our unity and stability and create division. So I'm going to have, I'm going to point out three things that I guess further illustrate what happened from Solomon and the line of his family and what we can maybe learn from it. So uh, first thing is this, and I'm going to look at uh, uh, from 1 Kings 12 through 14 mainly, but I'm going to look at a couple of illustrations. Uh, first of all, be careful who you listen to. Wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. Kind of like people saying what you want to hear or people saying the hard things that you need to hear that you maybe don't want to hear, but it's coming from a friend that you know and trust, and you go, thank you, right? I needed to be convicted of that. I needed to be, I didn't see that coming. And that's a friend. That's a true friend that can speak truth into your life, whereas people that just say whatever, oh, that, that make you happy, or that the words you want to say, sometimes people call them yes men in your life, that always, oh yeah, you're the best, you're the best boss, you're the best friend, you're the best person, you know, love you, love you and then never really are willing to see what they re maybe you really need to hear, too, right? So think about that for a moment. Because um, in this uh, interesting way, uh, uh, Rehoboam, one of the sons of, of Solomon, was chosen to be king through lots of t broken ways, but uh, he went first to get some wisdom from the elders. As a new king, makes sense, right? If you're, if you're new to ruling... Uh, a kingdom that you'd go to people that kind of been around the block. It's kind of like the same in life. You know, you kind of, hopefully you have people in your life that are a little older and wiser than you are that you can say, yeah, thank you. Whether it's a father, a grandfather, a, a, a friend, somebody just that you know of, it's important to have those kind of people in our lives, right? That can think about this. Maybe they've made mistakes. Don't repeat my mistakes of the past. This is what happened to me. This is for your good. Do, would you agree? That's generally good. And and the elders spoke to Rehoboam in 1 Kings 12, 7 and said, If today you'll be a servant to these people and serve them and give them a favorable answer, they will always be your servants. Kind of that theme that you may hear about these days of a servant leader, right? And if you've had someone that's a boss or someone higher than you that you know really has your back and you're best things in mind and maybe has to make some hard decisions too but is really looking out for you that's okay that's that's good leadership that's good leadership and so okay Rehoboam hears him out but yet Rehoboam said I'm gonna keep looking though I'm gonna go to my buddies uh, the guys I grew up with and see what they say and King Solomon at this time had had a, a, a reputation as he grew his kingdom he was a hard man. He was a taskmaster. He really put it on heavy on the people, on the people of Israel. So there's a little bit of resentment and maybe tendency towards some rebellion of the, just the general people towards leadership of King Solomon. But, so, I think the elders get it. They go, you know, listen, you need to show them you're willing to be their king and to serve them as a, as a good king. But the, the, the guys around him, look, look at what they say. This is from... This is from... 1 Kings 12, 10, and 11. So right after that, I could say these are words of division from friends. It says, The young men who had grown up with him replied, 
Tell these people who have said to you, your father put a heavy yoke on us, but make our yoke lighter. Tell them, my little finger is thicker than my father's waist. My father laid on you a heavy yoke. I will make it even heavier. My father scourged you with whips. I'll scourge you with scorpions. Kind of like, give them the fear of God and the, the fear of Rehoboam, right? Oh, yeah, we'll, we'll listen to you. And that didn't go well. That didn't go well. He listened to the unwise counsel. The nation of Israel divided. And of the 12 tribes of Israel, only those living in the towns of Judah stay with Rehoboam. And the rest rallied behind Jeroboam, the brother that was lurking in the wings that had been promised the kingdom. And he takes him and starts up the northern kingdom. So here's the split. South and north. Rehoboam's got Judah. And they're probably not real happy with him either. And Jeroboam takes the other tribes and they establish the northern, the northern kingdom. And that division happened in 930 B.C. And all the way through the Old Testament. And I can't imagine how horrible that would have been for that division and that anger, that hostility. It's like a Hatfield-McCoy kind of thing. It's like there's always somebody trying to get someone else and it's just fighting and wars, and we see that throughout the, the scriptures. The reminder, too, is this. I read this quote. It said, Once a house on the inside turns against itself, it's just a matter of time before that house crumbles. If the, if the house internally is crumbling on itself, it's just going to be a matter of time before it all crumbles down. And look at how this all kind of unfolded. Rehoboam rejecting the advice of his elders, telling the yes people, the yes men, and listening to the yes men in his life, but said, yeah, just give it to him. You're the king. And maybe they have some other ulterior motives in mind too, trying to give him what he wants to hear. And once again, that, that uh, sad reminder, be careful who you listen to. Wounds from a friend can be trusted. An enemy multiplies kisses. So having people around us that will keep us on the right path. Another reminder, just in case we, we are kind of a tendency to point our finger at everybody else as the one that's causing division around us. Division is seldom one-sided. Own your part. And as we see in Romans, if it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. So we probably all know people that are always the ones. They're always, it's always somebody else's fault. They're the, they're the problem. They're the one that started it. Well, look back to yourself then too, right? We all need to do that. What part do I maybe have to play in this? And also, as Jesus said, get back to Jesus' words. Didn't he say something about praying for your enemies? Bless those who curse you. Even on the cross, when Jesus was hanging on the cross, and he prayed out, he cried out, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Lost people act like lost people. And if people are away from God and away from, why should you expect anything other than they're going to do human, selfish kinds of things, right? So pray and be a peacemaker. Look to Jesus. Look to the example of one who brought us peace when we were far off from God. He became our peace through the cross through his death and his resurrection. And uh, all these escalations that we see with the kingdom, with Solomon, with uh, these kings, Rehoboam and Jeroboam, um, it, just gets, it just gets worse and worse. Um, again, all the parts that people have to play. Uh, Jeroboam goes to the northern kingdom, or establishes the northern kingdom, and one of the first things he does, so that people don't go back to Judah, to where Rehoboam is, he sets up his own altars, and uh, get this, golden calves. Where did we hear that? Moses, golden calves, Aaron, that didn't go so well. Now, now they're back to idolatry, and offering sacrifices to things other than the one true God. And even Jeroboam gets confronted by a prophet who does some miraculous, dramatic things. And he doesn't listen to this prophet. So once again, both these kingdoms, Rehoboam, Jeroboam, there's things that are going wrong. Northern kingdom, southern kingdom. And it's all kind of 
kind of combine together. But always remember, it's, it's division is seldom just one-sided. And, you know, you can't control another person, but you can own your own part in that. Finally, the sad news reminder is, yes, division has a generational effect. And in 1 Kings 14.30, there was continual warfare uh, between Rehoboam and Jeroboam. Sometimes division has a way of seeking in. It can destroy families and ruin families for generations, even like this bitter Hatfield-McCoy rivalry. Um, the last reminder I want to give you is a reminder that, that God heals and God restores. And we always are given that opportunity, even as we prayed early in the service, and a reminder to return to the Lord, right? Start the new year in a way that, that gets your focus back off, off of just you and upon God and His plan. And a house divided, no, it will not stand, but a house united in God, in His Word, and the promises of Jesus can withstand anything. Do you believe that? God's promises remain. The forces of even hell will not prevail against God, His Word, and His promises. And so receive that. Receive that promise. And, you know, it's God's working. And even in this, you know, not so silly, but sad example of the Hatfields and the McCoys, it was in a 2003 that these two families declared an official truce 140 years after the first fight broke out. And I didn't read more, more deep into it spiritually what it all meant, but it's a reminder that healing can come. And uh, 60 descendants from both sides of this family came together. And the governors of Kentucky and West Virginia even signed this proclamation of, of truce, of not fighting anymore. And so ultimately, isn't that all of our wish Right? For peace in our midst, for peace, peace in our family, in our church, uh, in our lives. I mean, that's the ultimate. If you look down deep enough and a heart hasn't grown too hard, peace and the love of God prevails uh, against anything. And so that's, our, that's God's prayer for you and for me, to be united. Jesus himself prayed near, as he was nearing the cross. He says, uh, prayed that we would be one even as he and the Father are one. And uh, Paul challenges us, and throughout Scripture we see, to be in, of one mind, of one body, through the bond of peace. Satan wants nothing more than to destroy. Satan wants nothing more than to break up families, to destroy relationships, to create just ugly atmospheres in the workplace. Oh, he's just licking his chops and when he can break p people up and even destroy churches. That's, that's his goal. Steal, kill, and destroy. But let's return. Again, return to the Lord. He's the uniter. He can restore, as it says in the Bible, restore what the locusts have eaten. Right? Even God can make that restoration and renewal happen. So let's let God write the story let's go, of our lives, too, as we've venture now further into, uh, into this year um, as we learn the hard lessons that we hear from these ways things started right but got sideways real fast even with Solomon and then his descendants and let's get back to the word I'd like you to affirm this verse if you would please with me as we read from Micah 6 8 let's read it together he has showed you O oh man what is good and what does the Lord require of you to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. So we're going to stay united in God's Word. And I'm, I'm just so looking forward to this week. We've got some neat things starting up with our prayer night and the food and the fellowship and the even peace. Who needs peace in their financial realm that all, could be all kinds of different directions, right? Let's get centered upon the promises of God for peace for our lives, for our families. And uh, stay in the Word. Even week after week, we're still starting more and more groups. We'd like to do that this year, the community groups. And uh, take one home today if you don't have one. But I'd like us to pray. And let's just pause for a moment as we just uh, bow our heads and hearts and pray. And pray for those in need that are on our hearts right now. On this world that's broken, that needs a Savior, as we do. Lord, we thank you for your great love that you ultimately would be the healer of the nations, even in the broken times of Israel. Lord, that's how you came in Jesus, 
many years later to restore what was broken and to be the ultimate healer and renewer of all our lives. So, Lord, we want to place our trust in you and the saving grace of Jesus our Lord and invite you to, uh, again, heal any broken places. We pray for those who are struggling right now with illness and pain uh, of any kinds, cancer, other injuries. Uh, Lord, physically, we know people that need healing, and we lift up, uh, uh, continue to lift up Dottie Cook. Thankful she's home from the hospital. Bless her as her back heals and treatment she receives. Uh, thankful for Frank Walsh and his faithfulness to come and his 90-plus years just continuing to overcome any other obstacles uh, to be here in worship. And Lord, for other people right now on our minds, our hearts, we pray for uh, going through any dark night of pain or illness, any families that need restoring and healing. Uh, come, Lord Jesus. Any marriages that uh, things are on the rocks. Lord, be their healer. Uh, be their strength. For the workplace, school, many things that are kind of renewing or starting up again in this new year. Uh, guide us, Lord, into whatever realm you'd have us. Our, our workplaces, our families, schools. Uh, guide our thoughts, guide our hearts. Help us be people of peace. And God, guide our nation and our world. There are so many broken things around us and wars and rumors of wars. And we just pray for, again, for peace to prevail and healing among the nations. So we give you this time, thankful for your word that guides us and directs us and gives us hope. In Jesus' name we pray.